Uh, thank you very much for joining us at this month's First Thursday Club. I'm Gavin Wilson, I'm a director of uh, RSK Biosensus and I'm delighted to be hosting the webinar today and I'm going to be managing your questions uh, at the end of the talk. Okay, so we've got a couple of small bits of housekeeping to go through before we start. So all attendees' microphones will be automatically muted during the webinar. If you've got any questions, and I would encourage you to do so, we'll have plenty of time, please enter them in the Q&A box uh, online. And we'll answer as many of them as we can at the end of the webinar. Any that we don't have time to answer, we'll try and follow up with you afterwards. So about an hour after we finish, we'll send you a, a short survey and please spare us a few minutes, uh, if you can, to give us a little bit of feedback uh, to help shape future webinars. So uh, our speaker today is my colleague, Richard, or Des Delahay. So Des is, is also a director in RSK Biosensus. Uh, he's had an extensive career as a research scientist working for government research agencies, but also including wide-ranging collaboration with universities, and he holds an honorary professorship at Exeter University. This is a specialist in the ecology of wildlife diseases and management, but its more recent work on residential gardens and their value to biodiversity that he's going to speak about today. So, without further ado, over to you, Des. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much, Gav, for that, uh, that wonderful introduction. Yeah, as Gav says, I'm going to talk to you about uh, biodiversity in residential gardens. Um, but I think what I'll do is I'll start off with a few um, excuses. Um, one is that uh, I'm no gardener. So um, uh, if you're expecting green fingered tips on gardening, then you've probably come to the wrong place. Um, I'm also not a botanist, so um, don't be expecting any great botanical insights in what I'm going to say. And then, uh, possibly rather frustratingly uh, for some of you, I hope you're not looking for wildlife gardening tips because that won't really be the focus of what I'm talking about. We will talk about interventions to uh, encourage wildlife into your gardens, uh, but I'm, I won't be proffering uh, tips as such. But what I am going to do is I'm going to talk about some work that we did recently to review the scientific evidence uh, around the biodiversity value of residential gardens and this was funded by a company called Evergreen Garden Care. So what I'll do over the course of the next uh, uh, 25 minutes or so is I'm going to describe the main patterns and drivers of biodiversity in gardens that we observed from the literature, the potential benefits that gardens uh, might bring to urban biodiversity and some of the challenges that might be associated in realising those benefits. So we'll start off with a nice simple question. Um, what is a garden? Well, it's uh, the dictionary definition would be that it's an enclosed area. We're, we're all probably most familiar with the modern Western style garden. Uh, quite often consisting of a lawn, ornamental planting, perhaps an area set aside for vegetable or fruit uh, uh, cultivation. And you can see an example of a large uh, uh, suburban garden in the top left of the, of the screen there with a lawn, borders, trees and so on. Um, but, uh, but sometimes modern gardens can be very, very stylized with a lot of hard standing, uh, plants arranged in planters. And uh, in that picture uh, below, you can see what looks suspiciously like uh, artificial turf rather than a, a natural lawn. The world gardens are quite different though in, uh, in Japan and China for example. Gardens are mostly focused on stones, uh, water features, mosses, small trees and shrubs. Often referred to as the developing world and the kind of gardens that we see are what are called home gardens. And these are essentially small scale agroforestry systems associated with residential dwellings and uh, they provide subsistence uh, materials to the inhabitants. So food, uh, medicinal plants, cosmetics, other materials that are, that are valuable to people. And uh, you can see an example there in that picture that this is what's called a pekarangan, which is a kind of home garden that you'll find in Indonesia. And you can see in the foreground orange trees growing. 
Now, these gardens are all very different, but the one thing that they have in common is that we can consider them to be designer ecosystems, essentially. Their characteristics reflect the individual preferences and the values of the people that live there, and they're actively managed. And so there's an opportunity there for us to tweak that management in order to influence biodiversity. So I'm sure many of you will have, uh, will have noticed that uh, wildlife gardening is a, is a particularly hot topic. Uh, there's been a, an apparent explosion of interest uh, over recent years, possibly partly fueled by the pandemic with people staying at home more, uh, used uh, much more. And so there's no shortage of advice out there on websites and magazines and what have you, TV programs even, uh, uh, from conservation groups, gardening organizations, and, uh, and, uh, and other groups about how you can improve your garden uh, to the benefit of wildlife. But what do we really know about what drives biodiversity in gardens? You know, what does the scientific evidence say? And uh, how can we promote this? So there's been an awful lot of academic interest in recent years uh, uh, in gardens, uh, a great deal of interest, for example, in the physical, mental health and well-being benefits of gardens and gardening. And that has almost certainly been spurred on by the experience of the pandemic. Uh, of academic interest in the biodiversity characteristics of gardens. And you can see here a graph showing the total number of peer-reviewed scientific journal articles that related to biodiversity in gardens over the last 20 years. And you can see that there's been quite a significant increase. Now, the majority of those studies have tended to be from Europe or North America and uh, New Zealand and Australia. And so they tend to reflect biodiversity in these modern Western style gardens. So in studies where garden biodiversity has been measured in some, way, in some way, then what were the main drivers? What were the things that were encouraging a greater number of species uh, uh, to inhabit gardens? One of the first things uh, that we found when we looked at the, uh, at the evidence available in the scientific literature was that something called habitat heterogeneity is really important. And um, by that we mean complexity in habitat structure more different kinds of habitats that you have in a garden, then the more ecological niches, the more opportunities there are for a variety of plants and animal species uh, to exist. And so this complexity promotes biodiversity. And in a garden, as you increase the habitat heterogeneity, so the habitat starts more to resemble a natural ecosystem. And you can see in the picture at the bottom here, where the garden has been allowed to find its own way to a certain extent. There's been some planting in the foreground, but it's been allowed to develop um, this habitat uh, to find its own way. And, and you can see that it resembles a natural ecosystem, much in contrast to the uh, neat and formal gardens that you can see in the images above. Where you allow uh, more habitat heterogeneity, then the garden habitats start to look a little bit wilder, less neat and tidy. Now, psychologists tell us that we find wilder landscapes far more aesthetically appealing. Yet, messy gardens are considered to be unpopular, not only with gardeners, but also perhaps with their neighbours. So this creates something of a, of a paradox, and there are a number of reasons uh, for that. Gardens have to function uh, have to have a variety of different uses. You know, you may not only want your garden to be aesthetically pleasing, but you may want to use it for recreation, for entertaining uh, uh, friends and so on. So they have to be a compromise to a certain extent between all these different uses. There are social pressures around us keeping a neat and tidy garden. Will our neighbours uh, think less of us if we allow our gardens to be a little more unruly? Psychologists also tell us that we have an innate desire for control of our local environment. And so that's reflected in the formality in our gardens quite often. And then there's a very interesting uh, idea around something called the Savannah hypothesis. Now th this hypothesis is the idea that human beings evolved in landscapes that were open, Savannah landscapes essentially, comprising uh, grasslands with scattered trees and shrubs. Uh, these environments provided opportunity to see prey that were a long distance away, 
fantasy predators uh, that might be a, a risk for early humans. And it's believed that this is so hardwired in our uh, psyche that we uh, reflect that, that liking for that kind of savanna uh, landscape look in the uh, characteristics of our gardens. So another really important driver of biodiversity in gardens that we found uh, across many of the studies was the diversity and the abundance of flowering plants. So the diversity of plant communities per se is related to the diversity of invertebrates that you'll find in a garden. The diversity of flowering plants has also been shown to increase the diversity and interestingly also the abundance of invertebrates because obviously it's providing more different resources. And you know plants provide a whole variety of different resources to invertebrates. They can be food for adult invertebrates, they can provide larval host plants, or they can provide nectar and pollen. And the benefits of flowering plants in gardens uh, that draws in these invertebrates can actually be realised in the wider um, countryside. So, so this study that was, uh, was carried out by a group of Swedish biologists showed that in an intensively farmed landscape, native plants were more likely to be pollinated and to set seed the closer that they were to residential gardens. And so the strong implication of that study is that these gardens were actually exporting pollination services into this uh, agriculturally intense landscape where pollinators were in far more limited supply. So another important driver that we find in the literature of uh, biodiversity in gardens is uh, the management practices. So intensive management in gardens, by which I mean things like regular soil tilling, weeding, watering, fertilizer and pesticide use, they've been associated with an increase in the overall floral species richness. However, they're also associated with a decrease in native species diversity. And this isn't surprising really, because a lot of intensive management of gardens is geared towards raising non-native species. And this is at the expense of native species. But what we also find, which is quite interesting, is that intensive management practices can have much more far reaching impacts on the functioning of ecosystems in your garden. So, for example, uh, some studies have shown that there's actually a reduction in soil invertebrate biomass associated with many of these practices and that that can impede soil functioning. So processes like decomposition and water retention can be um, uh, reduced in their effectiveness as a result of intensive management practices in gardens. And surprisingly, pesticide and herbicide use in gardens is associated with negative impacts on arthropods, including pollinators. And we see uh, uh, studies in the wider environment that show the same. Also, fertilizer application and watering decreases plant species richness in gardens generally because it selects for just a minority of species. And those would tend to be the non-native species that can, that can handle a more enriched uh, local environment. Uh, frequent mowing can also reduce the diversity of species uh, in a lawn by um, selecting for those that can uh, that have vegetative reproduction um, rather than, because it doesn't allow plants to mature sufficiently to produce pollen and set seed. And infrequent mowing, it follows, has been shown in some studies to be associated with increasing the diversity of plants in your lawn. But that's by no means the full story. In, in several other studies, it's been shown that frequent lawn mowing or reducing the frequency of lawn mowing rather, can, that has no or very little impact on the diversity of species. So there's still a lot of complexity in that relationship that we need to, uh, to bottom out to really understand what kind of mowing regimes uh, promote diversity uh, in your garden best. So let's talk a little bit about the, the role of these non-native so non-native plants, they represent a very large proportion of plant species that are in gardens. And, and that accounts for some very, very high recorded uh, uh, measures of diversity in samples of gardens. In fact, higher measures of diversity than you would find in natural habitats. Now we know, uh, as ecologists, we know that uh, the spread of non-natives uh, uh, into natural environments can be extremely problematic. They can outcompete native species and completely change the characteristics of native ecosystems. And gardens have a role to play in that because uh, promoting the growth of non-natives in gardens can allow them to spread into the wider countryside 
and this contributes to this this broader phenomenon of homogenization where you get ecosystem simplification and degradation and some non-native plants are certainly unattractive for our native pollinators and that's not really surprising because the two have not evolved together. Now some are unattractive to our, our native pollinators because they have structural challenges. So this plant here, which is a, a quite a popular plant amongst gardeners called scarlet sage, it's known from studies to be almost impenetrable by the vast majority of our bees. Uh, they, they simply cannot get inside the flower because of its structure uh, to the nectar rewards uh, that are inside. And this is the same of other structural spe uh, other uh, introduced species, which have these structural challenges to our, our pollinators. And also some cultivars also uh, have extra petals or whatever that, that create a complex flower structure that makes it difficult for uh, pollinators to get inside. And some even have no nectar rewards whatsoever surprised that we find in studies that there is greater diversity and abundance of insect visitors in gardens where you've got native species present because they've evolved in the same circumstance. Non-native species are widely vilified amongst conservationists um, and, uh, uh, and amongst ecologists, but, but, but are they really all bad? This uh, rather provocative article by Mark Davis and a, and a bunch of other ecologists uh, uh, seeks to try to open that argument up a bit and saying, well, we shouldn't necessarily judge non-native species simply on their geography. Maybe we need to look at other characteristics. So we can see that in gardens where non-natives can be sources of nectar, pollen and food for, uh, for invertebrates when native plants are seasonally unavailable, for example. Interestingly, they can replace lost or rare native species. So in this study by uh, Arthur Shapiro in, in California, he looked at the native butterfly community in these suburban areas. And what he found was that their host plants were largely absent uh, for many of these species. And so they were almost entirely reliant on non-native species. And so he concluded that as a result of that, if certain alien weeds were to be eradicated or their abundance greatly reduced, then this butterfly community would disappear. So here we can see a situation where non-natives are completely supporting a native community of invertebrates. So we need to think carefully about non-native species in the context of gardens, um, maybe select them on the basis of their functional attributes uh, rather than just discarding them simply on the basis of geography. So another area that I was interested to explore when we carried out the, uh, uh, the examination of the evidence base was to look at whether interventions to try and improve uh, the wildlife friendliness, friendliness of your garden uh, were actually effective. So there's a great deal of advice out there on wildlife gardening interventions, but much of it is really untested. Only 8% of the articles we looked at in our literature review, review actually included any experimental manipulation to test any interventions studies still remains uh, 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 this study here by Kevin Gaston and colleagues uh, from back in 2005. And what they did was they uh, they looked at introducing a variety of different interventions into gardens uh, and whether or not they worked. So they looked at providing artificial nest sites for bees, for solitary bees and wasps. So, so you can see a picture in the top right hand corner of these holes uh, and cavities created by, by one of these uh, bug boxes. So that sort of thing. They looked at bumblebee artificial nest, which consisted essentially of a, of a flower pot uh, upturned, sometimes buried partly in the ground. And what, what they found was really varied. They found that the solitary insect uh, um, interventions, uh, nesting sites, were really fairly successful. There was a lot of variation, but they were fairly successful. But interestingly, they found that the bumblebee artificial nests were 100% unsuccessful. Uh, they also looked at small ponds in plastic containers and found that these were able to sustain uh, an aquatic uh, ecosystem over the course of three seasons, but that the number of aquatic invertebrates that they attracted was really very, very low. Dead wood piles attracted a variety of invertebrates, but not the specialists that you would have hoped uh, might colonize decaying wood. And that's probably because the wood was only out there for three seasons. It was freshly cut, put out for three seasons, and that's not sufficient time to attract these specialist organisms. 
the introduction of nettle patches into gardens, which incidentally was relatively unpopular with a lot of the gardeners that they enlisted into this study, uh, that had an interesting uh, result, which was that butterfly species that were known to use nettles as larval host plants uh, seldom used the nettle patches uh, that were put out in gardens. And, and a possible reason for this is that nettle patches are not, are not a limiting resource. You know, you can, across a suburban area, you can find lots and lots of patches of nettles. So introducing another one into your garden isn't necessarily going to have a very big impact. So what they concluded was that whilst some of these measures could be very effective, the, the uh, nest sites for solitary uh, bees and wasps in particular, others have a pretty low probability of success, and especially over the time scales and the spatial scales, likely to be acceptable to, to garden owners. And that's important because if interventions are going to be um, at the spur to people uh, uh, doing more to enhance biodiversity in their gardens, then really people have got to be able to see some benefits in the relatively short term. And so what we need is some better replicated experimental studies, like the one that Gaston, uh, Gaston and his colleagues uh, uh, carried out uh, at large scales to try to really understand which interventions can give us some quick wins. So another area where there's been uh, of advice proffered is uh, on pollinator friendly plants. But the evidence from experimental studies on which plants are particularly preferable to pollinating species is relatively scarce and it's quite contradictory as well. And one of the reasons why the evidence is quite contradictory and that's that it's really challenging to carry out the kind of work in the field that you need in order to quantify insect preferences to flowering plants. And, and this paper by Rosie Rollings and, and, and Dave Golson nicely describes some of those challenges. So for example, it's very context specific. The, uh, the pollinators uh, that visit uh, uh, plants are, are going to depend in any area on what the available resources are in the surrounding area. Also, growing conditions can influence the, ma the maturity of plants, their, their particular life stage, how productive they are in terms of nectar and pollen. And we see a lot of variation even within species amongst individual plants in their nectar secretion and depletion rates. So these are really practical challenges in, in carrying out that kind of work, but you can start to iron those out if we have bigger replicated studies. And just before we leave pollinators, uh, just a couple of words of warning about what you will see labelled as pollinator friendly plants. You have lists out there that you can download from the internet or you'll find in magazines or, or what have you, and you'll see the labels on plants at your local garden centre uh, and so on. But if we just return to our, our old friend uh, Scarlet Sage here, which is relatively impenetrable to uh, a lot of pollinators, um, uh, it didn't take me longer than a couple of minutes to find this plant listed amongst the lists of pollinator friendly plants. But can it really be described as such? I'm not so sure. So take those lists with a big pinch of salt. And then there's the thorny issue of uh, pesticide residues on plants. So this rather alarming study that was carried out in 2017, uh, the, the researchers went out and they collected a variety of, of uh, uh, labelled pollinator friendly plants from garden centres, DIY stores and nurseries and then they analysed them for pesticide residues and quite quite surprisingly and alarmingly they found that 93% contained residues of pesticides. Uh, about 40% of them I think uh, had res residues from more than one type of pesticide and many of them also had residues from fungicides. So I think we need to think very carefully about sourcing plants for our gardens if we want to really benefit pollinators and not incidentally introduce toxic substances. So let's talk a little bit about instances where we have good evidence that gardens uh, have played an important role in, in conservation. So I'm sure many of you will be aware that there, are, uh, there is good documented evidence of positive effects of feeding birds in our gardens. Uh, and, and in the UK, we're actually supporting some populations that are in decline in the wider countryside uh, by feeding them in our gardens. But in some studies, some negative effects have been shown. There's a study in the US, for example, that showed feeding birds in your garden was likely to attract non-native species that then outcompeted 
local native species. So there can be risks involved in this. Another success story in the UK really is the recolonisation of the red kite, and that appears to have been quite positively influenced by people feeding them in their gardens near the reintroduction areas. Here that I'd like to highlight, which uh, which are really highly dependent these days uh, on gardens. The first is the western ringtail possum, which is a highly endangered marsupial from Australia, and uh, 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 the, the, these uh, these possums are found almost exclusively in suburban gardens. Uh, so so these gardens are providing a habitat that's uh, almost uh, uh, almost completely unavailable elsewhere. Uh, and the Nisna warbler. Similarly, in South, South Africa, uh, similarly, that occupies suburban gardens. Uh, it's found there far more often than it's found uh, in the wild these days. And, and it's thought that this is because the, uh, the suburban gardens, they, they sort of look a little bit like the, uh, the forest glades that the bird would naturally inhabit in the wild. Much closer to home is the, uh, is the Western European hedgehog, uh, which is in severe decline uh, nationally in the UK, but there are several strands of evidence that seem to suggest that domestic gardens may be important refuges for this species. And just staying on the subject of conservation, there are also much wider benefits of gardens to conservation. Gardens are where most people encounter nature. So in a world where opportunities to uh, interact with the natural world are becoming rarer and rarer, gardens appear to be one of the few opportunities left to do that. And so they're tools, tools that we can use to foster public engagement in conservation and in science. And it's no wonder that many citizen science projects have been focused on collecting information about, about different species in gardens. So for example, uh, uh, bird surveys in gardens, the garden bird survey, uh, butterfly and moth survey schemes. There's even a, a scheme in the US to look at elk species in your garden. And there's evidence from studies that involvement in these kind of garden based projects and others stimulates participation in other wider conservation initiatives. So it appears that gardens may be satisfying a deep human need to connect with nature and that that may be required to engage more widely with conservation. So how do we try to scale up the uh, benefits of gardens? Because after all, gardens are individual plots and they can be highly fragmented in the environment. Well, there's a lot of potential to provide connectivity amongst gardens and between gardens and other green infrastructure in urban areas, and also to the wider semi-natural and natural habitats that surround uh, cities. Now, research work has shown that solid fences and walls act as very severe barriers to dispersal of many organisms, including invertebrates, um, amongst gardens. But it shows that where corridors have been provided, then this can allow the dispersal of a wide range of species, birds, bats. Uh, there was a study showing, showing the same for shrews and, uh, and arthropods. And interestingly, some work on the use of small patches of urban woodland by birds has shown that they can collectively function as a single contiguous habitat if they are well connected. And so you get added benefits to connecting up uh, all of these little uh, patches of habitat. That's important when we start to think about uh, the value that gardens may have for providing ecosystem services like pollination, for example. And so if you if Gardens are far more joined up with the green infrastructure uh, that's elsewhere in urban environments and with the wider countryside, then you can see that this is a route for um, disseminating these e ecosystem services more broadly across the landscape. So I have to urban biodiversity, and that's not least because they comprise such a large area um, uh, in the urban landscape. So in, in one study, looking across a variety of urban areas in the UK, it was estimated that gardens uh, uh, represented between 22 and 27 percent of all of the urban area. And that they represented between 35 and 47 percent of the urban green space in a, in a sample of a couple of UK cities. 
So with the extent of urban coverage increasing worldwide and the accompanying degradation or loss of other habitats, then the relative importance of gardens as sources of biodiversity is going to continue to grow. We just do need to be aware of not falling a trap uh, because of the shifting baseline syndrome. So the reason why, well, one of the reasons why garden biodiversity is becoming relatively more important is because biodiversity is being trashed elsewhere in semi-natural and natural environments. And of course, one of the causes of the degradation of these other ecosystems or the disappearance of these ecosystems is urbanization, which is the process that gives rise to gardens. So we just need to be aware of the wider context uh, in which we're discussing the value of biodiversity in gardens. So what might be some of the challenges in enhancing biodiversity? In well, in recent years, uh, we've seen garden biodiversity start to appear in uh, local and national government policy initiatives. So that shows some appetite uh, from the authorities to try to um, uh, 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 increase garden biodiversity uh, to the benefit of uh, urban areas. There are some major challenges for policymakers in trying to harness that potential. Uh, and not least of which is the fact that the gardens are privately owned or, or, they're in, uh, or, or their management is the subject of individuals who are in rented accommodation, for example. So they're outside the control of administrative decisions. They reflect individual preferences and sometimes social, stress, uh, social pressures, as I mentioned earlier. And of course, they're very fragmented, which we've mentioned previously. In the UK, we've got a particular problem with the loss of front gardens to car parking space and the loss of rear gardens to development. And in Germany, in, in actual fact, they're also seeing in some areas the loss of front gardens to car parking. And this is having an impact on urban drainage uh, uh, management uh, to such an extent that in some German cities, they've introduced legislation to reduce the proportion of your front garden that you can subject to uh, hard surfaces, that you can turn into hard surfacing. And then we've seen a growing trend uh, in developments over the years of a reducing plot size for gardens. So these are all areas where perhaps uh, uh, we need to uh, our policy could, uh, could make some steps forward. So speaking of steps forward, these are just a few ideas uh, from me on, on things that I think are going to be important in the future. I think we need more research, I would say that, I'm a scientist, uh, more research to improve the evidence base, in particular in relation to interventions for wildlife friendly gardening, and uh, ways in which we can give people quick wins so that we can in, get, get, get their engagement for longer, to, for a more sustained approach to enhancing their gardens for biodiversity. There are areas where we certainly need policy, uh, and one is to integrate garden connectivity into new developments, possibly looking at retrofitting connectivity into existing residential. And there's probably a need to look again at how we can retain more ecological features in the face of, of development of residential areas. And I think that the requirement to demonstrate 10% biodiversity net gain might be a useful lever in that respect. And then there are ways and means of using new standards, frameworks of, of standards for developers to try to encourage them to um, design garden plots and new developments uh, with biodiversity in mind and, and with connectedness in mind. And there are opportunities, I think, for collaborations between local authorities and private households or, or groups of households represented by neighborhood associations. For example. And, uh, uh, I have read about some studies where, where uh, local authorities have encouraged householders to self-assess the biodiversity value of their gardens and then specialist advice and positive feedback to try to encourage uh, some momentum in, uh, in um, enhancing the biodiversity value of gardens in certain neighbourhoods. Producing certification schemes where you're rewarding uh, uh, people for um, raising the habitat quality uh, of their gardens for wildlife and there's a very uh, successful scheme led by the US uh, National Wildlife Foundation. That's a good example of that. But I'm sure uh, these are just a few of my ideas. I'm sure you have ideas of your own. And if we've got time, it would be great to hear uh, about those uh, in the chat. So it just remains for me to say uh, thank you to Green Garden Care Limited, who started us off on this journey by providing 
uh, funding for us to carry out the, the, uh, the literature review. And to my colleague at Exeter University, Professor Kevin Gaston, who I'll be co-authoring the review paper with. So, thanks for... Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Des, for a really interesting and thought-provoking uh, talk. So I'm sure I'm one of many, probably all on this call, who are keen to do the best we can for wildlife uh, with our gardens. Uh, and it's really helpful, I think, to have that sort of overview and, and, and perhaps question some of our inbuilt assumptions about what is uh, valuable, valuable for wildlife. Um, so I've had a couple of questions. Um, so we'll take those, and, and if I could start, so I, I know you said that, that you wouldn't be giving out uh, uh, wildlife gardening tips, but given all the evidence that you've reviewed, you know, can you help us out a bit? Do you have any general advice that you could give us? Okay, well, fortunately, I rather anticipated that uh, that, that, that question might come up, and I felt bad sort of leaving everyone without at least a few sort of thoughts about this. So I did prepare a list of, of things that I think we can uh, we can take away from the evidence base. Uh, and I think uh, uh, they're pretty simple things. Incorporate a variety of different habitats in, into your garden. Um, increase the diversity of flowering plants in your garden as much as you can. The densely uh, planted uh, flower beds can be really useful resources for, for pollinating invertebrates. But, but, but don't forget to include some patches of, of bare ground where there's not planting, because that's a useful environment for various species as well. I think people should take a critical look at the advice that's out, that's out there, try out interventions, but because interventions are so, uh, the, the outcomes of interventions are so locally determined, they may work in some areas and not in others. So try things out and then stick with the things that seem to work in your particular location. And I think be aware as well that, that some things will take a while. You know, a rotting log pile is going to take a while before it starts to really attract those specialists organisms and so on. Um, yeah, and I, I would encourage people to go out there and experiment, go out and try things out, see what works, and use your garden to try to educate yourself and uh, and um, learn more about the natural environment and hopefully inspire others, you know, see if your neighbour would like to also do something similar in their garden and then compare notes, you know. Well, that, 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 those, are, those are my top tips for what they're worth. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Actually, related to that, then there's a question from Jenny, uh, who asks, um, you know, in the, the work that you've done reviewing the the evidence, was there any uh, evidence to, to suggest a, a sort of shift in psychology, you know, with people seeing sort of wild slash untidy gardens as attractive? Um, so I think it's uh, I think I didn't see any papers that specifically described. A shift towards um, accommodating a more untidy garden for the benefit of wildlife. I don't think I saw any evidence for that, but that's not to say that that's not happening. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just to say that you know that, that that may not have been reported. I think that an element of that is probably almost inevitable as we start to readjust the way we think about our gardens, because there is so much really quite inspirational. Uh, stuff out there about wildlife gardening you know if you take away the fact that there's not a lot of evidence underpinning certain specific things you know if you watch uh, uh, for example that the wild gardener you know it's quite an inspirational program and not everybody has a you know a plot that big that they can realize all these benefits but it can it can start you off down that road on on a smaller plot and I, th I think people are gradually turning to the idea that these natural uh, environments are appealing uh, and you know it's 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 worth sort of uh, accommodating a little bit of messiness in order to to encourage wildlife. And I think that you know there are compromises to be made. You know you do, you don't have to allow the whole of your garden to become this sort of natural sure. ecosystem. You know there are compromises to be made. Okay, great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I've got a question here from Stuart. Uh, he asks, it's interesting that there's so much evidence out there, which you mentioned, obviously there's all sorts, uh, on improving biodiversity in your garden that isn't based on any scientific scientific evidence. Yeah. And he asks, are, are there other ecological issues where the same is true? 
Oh, that's a very good question. I, I think there, uh, there are a lot of other areas where the same is probably true. We probably won't know until we look. Um, but, but certainly in, in ecological consultancy, for example, uh, there are quite a lot of things that we do um, in terms of mitigation and compensation and so on that uh, there isn't a good evidence base for. You know, they're, they're largely res the result of sort of received wisdom and the and the judgment of experts, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, that's what you, that's all you've got to go on if you don't actually have evidence from studies to test their effectiveness. But I think uh, I think it's quite widespread that we carry out practices to try and enhance uh, biodiversity or try and uh, mitigate ecological damage, and we don't actually know how 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 much benefit they they they, uh, they create, how well they uh, they actually work. So, uh, so I think more. Well, I think carrying out this kind of literature review is a really useful exercise in understanding just exactly where we are in terms of the evidence. You know what we can and can't say, and they're very useful for identifying the gaps. You know the places where we need a little more targeted research in order to refine the way we do things. Okay. Yeah. Great stuff. Uh, I've got a question here from Ian who asks. Uh, can you foresee a situation where pesticide use is banned in domestic gardens? Wow. Well, that might that might put a few companies out of the uh, well, at least force them to change their product lines. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I I can't particularly foresee it at the moment. Uh, I, I don't see enormously progressive uh, environmental policies sprouting out of the uh, the current regime, and I don't imagine that that's uh, that the banning of pesticides in gardens is, is is anywhere close, but I think the more the more evidence we can collect as to the uh, uh, the beneficial effects of avoiding pesticide use in gardens, then uh, uh, the better off we'll be. I think some certain pesticides have been banned from uh, from use in products that can be sold for use in the gardens, uh, uh, but I think that some of the European legislation on that is actually tighter than and the UK legislation around it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, we've probably got time for another qu one question, perhaps. Um, it's a question from Gemma, who says, "Thank you for an interesting talk, and that um, she is often recommending pollinator-friendly plants to incorporate into landscape designs. Uh, what is the best way to work out?" whether each plant is really pollinator friendly. Are there any trustworthy websites to follow uh, or is it down to research, uh, to researching each individual species? Yeah, well, well, research is really important for underpinning these, these kinds of lists. Um, what I would say is that, that some organisations have recognised that previously um, uh, advised species uh, should maybe not be on those lists. And I think that it's true that Natural England have changed some advice that they had provided in relation to um, pollinator friendly um, plants. Um, and so the more recent uh, uh, information that they've issued, I can't remember in ex exactly what context, but the more recent information from Natural England uh, has certainly um, been scanned with a view to what the evidence says. So that's, I would say that that's towards the more reliable end things. Um, I think uh, I think it's sometimes a question of trying things out really uh, for yourself. As I said, it's often so site specific, you know, context specific yeah. because it depends what other resources are around. I realise that's not an option when you're trying to advise on planting schemes. Uh, uh, but, um, but yeah, I would look to Natural England and, and some of the more um, trustworthy uh, uh, conservation organisations that are perhaps more likely to have actually looked at the evidence more closely. And local experts, local ecologists, you know, will probably have a good idea of what kinds of plants thrive in those areas and tend to be more attracted to invertebrates. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So we are now slightly over time, and I think we'll stop at that. There are a couple of outstanding questions, but and we'll endeavour uh, to answer those afterwards. Sure. Um, so it's just left for me really to say uh, thank you again, Des, for an excellent presentation, and thank you all for joining. Uh, our next First Thursday Club is on Thursday the 6th of January and the talk is A Class Act, Changes in Environmental Regulations and that's going to be given by Tim Hounsom. And on that, have a good afternoon and goodbye. Cheers, bye-bye.